outside and doing. So Dr. Ben Siddes is currently Senior Director, Head of Oncology Bioinformatics within Oncology R&D at AstraZeneca. His team is responsible for delivering data-driven, actionable insights through the applications of computational science to all parts of the oncology portfolio. Prior to joining AstraZeneca in 2015, Ben spent eight years at Pfizer and has an extensive experience in many aspects of drug discovery for major pharma. Ben's personal areas of focus include immuno-oncology, network biology, and the role of bioinformatics within drug discovery. Ben has a PhD in molecular biology and bioinformatics from the University of London, where his thesis focused on the development of predictive markers for the diagnosis of asymptomatic tuberculosis. Ben holds patents for two clinical diagnostics and has authored over 30 scientific publications. So today, Ben is going to discuss knowledge graphs for drug discovery at AstraZeneca. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. And as I say, can last one last reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the question box and we'll get, I'll be addressing these later. OK, over to you, Ben. Fantastic. So thank you, Mark, and thank you, Byrelate, for inviting me to speak, and uh, particularly alongside such a fantastic panel. Um, OK, so um, I thought first, um, before I get into the meat, I would um, just take a moment to describe the group. So a little bit of PR. Um, you know, just mentioned that you know, come 2022, we'll be hiring um, extensively. So look out for that. Um, as Mark mentioned, the group um, basically provides bioinformatics, data science and computational biology for the AstraZeneca oncology portfolio. So we're involved in everything from new target discovery uh, through to biomarker discovery, you know, characterization of our novel drug molecules. But in addition, we also develop a lot of novel bioinformatics and particular data science methodology and really our knowledge graph efforts fit into this piece. Uh, and in addition, you know, we, we do a lot of work to try and, um, you know, apply computational techniques to understand more of the systems that we're trying to, to drug and treat. And um, obviously a lot of that involves uh, the kind of data that we're discussing today. I put on here a few publications that kind of illustrate some of the work we've done recently. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is go through, um, you know, particularly how we're now uh, using Knowledge Graph to um, support some of these efforts for the portfolio. Before I get into Knowledge Graph, so I, I wanted to reflect on the fact that um, causal interaction data, as Mark um, sort of introduced at the start, you know, has many uses in drug discovery and um, certainly is something that, although we don't call it Knowledge Graph, you know, this use of network biology has been um, incredibly valuable for us. Um, so on the left is an example of a, an algorithm called causal reasoning that uses these um, uh, causal interactions to sort of infer the underlying cause of some experimental data. And, and that's been very successful and it's actually published over a decade ago, but it's still, we use it frequently, particularly to study the mechanism of action of some drugs. And on the right is a more uh, recent example where um, we've used such um, causal relationships to define um, mechanistically associated biomarkers for drug targets that we're interested in. So in this case, we've used the, the network to find genes that were downstream of a, of a target they're interested in, H-O-A-R, uh, and we could define a set of genes that had a, a pharmacodynamic response to the drug, but also then really, um, you know, have potential to be patient selection markers um, when used as a, a gene expression signature. So there's plenty of, um, of use for this interaction data, but from here on, I'm going to focus on, focus on, on knowledge graphs. And, you know, the first question, you know, what makes knowledge graphs useful for drug discovery? Um, so really, you know, for us, um, we obviously have lots of data. We can build a graph representation of that data. Um, but what we really want to get at is what we refer to as the optimized rules. And um, you know, rules is, is simply shorthand for, you know, what is it that makes um, uh, you know, a cell or a tumor resistant to a drug? You know, what are the rules that govern which patients respond to a therapy? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and graphs are really powerful for this. You know, I sort of listed a few of the reasons you know, on the bottom, but you know, firstly, a graph can overcome sparse knowledge. And even though we have vast amounts of data, uh, you know, we don't have everything um, and we're always missing, we always have gaps. And so the graph really helps us work around those. 
biology is complex and there's a lot of what we call non-linear biology so there's redundant mechanisms etc that can confuse um, an analysis so the graph can really help represent and interpret those and the graph is also a great way of um, you know, handling multimodal data so when you have data from different types you want to be able to model it in one um, and then finally and probably most importantly you know, the graph lends itself to you know interpretability so any prediction made from a graph has an inherent um, explanation behind it and as the previous speaker you're really nicely demonstrated you can draw the paths that help you make the inference um, and that from a drug discovery perspective is absolutely essential so in terms of, of astrazeneca's knowledge graph effort so um, we've established uh, what we call the biological insights knowledge graph bikg for short um, and so really this is the, our internal knowledge graph effort the schematic at the bottom here sort of shows the the main process so we have a lot of um, data ingestion whether that's from you know, the literature unstructured um, data and also from databases internal and external that we pull into what we refer to as the the baseline knowledge graph bikg and then what's really important for us is we then supplement that baseline graph with our own internal data that could be preclinical data it might be omics it might be pharmacogenetics it could be anything um, but also clinical data so that they come from our clinical trials and we then run obviously a suite of various algorithms over the top and apply that to a, a variety of different um, applications one thing i wanted to uh, just emphasize was that the, the baseline graph really is the foundation for subsequent question specific graphs so i think one thing that we've learned um, uh, in this process is that there isn't one graph to rule them all if you like you can't just build a knowledge graph uh, and expect to be able to address every question you might have so we use the baseline graph uh, and then build from that um, specific um, oncology question related relative um, relative graphs so they are the ones that hold the internal data and are deeply specific to the question at hand and of course you know these two complement each other so the internal data flows back into the big graph where appropriate and we take stuff out of the big graph and where necessary and of course there's a trade-off in scale and speed uh, with using these but it's it's critically important that for us you have um you know the time and the effort to really tailor the graph to the application And another point before I get into the examples that I wanted to make um, is that, you know, in, adult, in addition to building a knowledge graph, which, you know, I think is recognized as an incredibly important thing to do, you need to have an extensive suite of analytical tools to make use of the graph, right? And I, I think that sort of is obvious, but it doesn't really get enough airtime, right? You, we need to be able to do stuff with the graph and we need to have both an intelligent analytics layer, but also intelligent people who can deal with that uh, graph. Um, and so there's a, you know, for, for the kind of major question that we ask in drug discovery, like what's the mechanism of disease, you know, why does a drug work on a particular subset of patients, which targets should I choose, et cetera. You know, there's a variety of established graph um, analytical methods that, that we can use. You know, and they're listed on the right. And in the main, they're fine. And, you know, I'm going to go on and um, primarily tell you about um, an example where we've we've looked to uh, um, select targets with the knowledge graph, and that uses you know fairly um, well well established, um, relatively simple sort of graph um, analytics. But there are cases where there isn't established um, uh, analytical method, and and one of those areas where we found that we needed to do some more work on this is when we're taking um, graphs into the the clinic, um, and one of the particular issues we find with clinical trial data um, is that it's relatively small, um, it's incredibly sparse, and when you're making predictions from a clinical trial, you can't afford to have a black box. Um, you know, particularly uh, working with clinicians, you need to have a, a completely explainable approach. So one of the methods that we've developed is an algorithm called GIST. Um, so there's a reference to the preprint at the bottom. Um, you know, which is an algorithm that uh, we're trying to develop, um, we're trying to discover resistance mechanisms from clinical trial data from a graph built with uh, both um, sort of reference baseline knowledge, but also the clinical data laid on top um, that can take into account, um, you know, 
the sparsity of the data. So there's a regularization mechanism that, that helps with that. And then there's also an intention mechanism to help us understand what is driving um, the subgraph predictions that we're making. So you know, to emphasize the point, as we, as we move into the clinic with knowledge graphs, there's a lot of work we need to do in terms of interpretation of the graph. Um, and for us, I think that's the future. You know, uh, um, a lot of people, including us, have used graphs for um, new target discovery. I think that's the low hanging fruit. Um, and when we start to take knowledge graph further and further down the drug discovery pipeline, we're going to find it harder and harder. And we're going to have to invest both in the graph itself, but also in the analytical technologies. OK, so to get on to my main example, um, and I want to talk to you about CRISPR screens and how we're using knowledge graphs to um, interpret the results from genome wide CRISPR screens. Um, so a CRISPR screen, um, you know, if, if you're not familiar, um, basically allows you to um, inactivate by knocking out or actually activate um, by inducing the expression of every gene in the genome. And so you take a pool of cells that have been engineered to um, express the machinery, if you like, that's required for the CRISPR um, uh, activity. You transduce that with a library of gene-specific um, uh, constructs that will knock out a gene or activate a gene. And you do that at um, an MOI that ensures you essentially have one knockout or activation event per cell. You then split your cells and you grow half in the presence of a negative control, so DMSO in this case, and then the other half you would grow in the presence of your drug. And because each of these knockout constructs is tagged, you can then use um, NGS so sequencing to um, essentially study the proportion of each of those knocked out sort of tags, if you like, uh, within the within the cells. And um, you know you could, you're essentially looking for an enrichment. So in this case, you know the red and the blue cell type. That corresponds to the knockout of, of a red and blue gene, you know, is enriched over the DMSO control. And so you can see that in this little plot on the right. And this is essentially what we're looking for: is that there's a there's a lot of noise, but most of it um, uh, is centered around the vertical here. But actually, there's a handful of genes that are enriched in the drug-treated population of cells. And so they are mutations or gene activation events that are conferring resistance to the drug under study. So great, fantastic. Um, the biggest problem, of course, is that we don't find you know, a handful, as is shown in this cartoon, we actually find thousands of hits from these um, screens, particularly when you combine both a knockout and an activation screen. So the challenge that we face and that we hope to use a knowledge graph for, you know, could we take these thousands of hits and actually um, reduce them, you know, shortlist from them, um, the hits that we think should be taken forward for further follow-up? So for our proof of concept, um, we applied this to a CRISPR screen um, from uh, some non-small cell lung cancer cell lines uh, using two drugs, gefitinib and tugrisone. And so lung cancer um, is one of the most dominant forms of cancer, and um, there has two major subtypes. And of those non-small cell lung cancers, you know, up to 40% of them are driven by mutations, activating mutations in a receptor called EGFR. A tyrosine kinase. And you know, we've become really quite good at drugging EGFR. Um, so the first generation uh, TKIs, so tyrosine kinase inhibitors, included gefitinib, uh, which very effectively um, inhibits signaling through this pathway. But the problem is resistance arose to uh, those molecules very quickly. And so particularly mutations like T790M, which occur in the binding site of the drug. And so second and third generation um, tyrosine kinase EGFR inhibitors have been um, uh, developed to overcome this resistance specifically. And so Tegriso is the AstraZeneca um, third generation EGFR inhibitor. And so what we're interested in learning now is what is going to cause resistance to this third generation of EGFR inhibitors. And so this screen was run. Um, you can see that there's uh, two different cell lines, two different drugs, knockout and activation screens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what that led to was 1,250 statistically significant hits from both the knockout and the activation screens. And the question that we posed um, is, you know, which of these do we take forward um, to an arrayed screen for validation? And then 
if successful in that subsequent you know, biological target validation. Um, you know, traditionally, without a knowledge graph, um, you know, our bioscientists would sit down with a list of 1,250 genes and they'd look through them and they'd say, yeah, we know about that one, never heard of that one, we know about that one. Yeah, they go away and do some literature research, et cetera. And then maybe a month later, they come back and say, well, I'm going to follow up this, these dozen, something like that. So there's a huge time sink for you know, a relatively um, sort of manual process. And so we're hopeful that the knowledge graph can both speed this up, but also bring some novel insight to the problem. The first um, uh, need, though, was to actually define what is a good resistance hit. Um, we need to take the biological problem and then convert it into a data science problem. And so the, the team at AZ um, did a really great um, effort to speak with you know, a whole variety of our um, bioscientists to understand you know, what do they think is a good resistance hit. And so you can see in these bubbles um, the sort of the, the different components that they were discussing that they articulate as being important to them as making a, or selecting a good resistance hit. And then the size of the bubble sort of represents their the importance that they associated with that element. And so you can do things like there's the effect size of the knockout. So did it really drive a large resistant phenotype or not? The consistency in the panel. So was it repeatable in different uh, replicates or different cell lines, etc. Um, you know, and uh, so on and so on. And there's there's things like drivability and clinical relevance, etc. And so to turn that into a data science problem, uh, we used a, a multi-parameter um, optimization approach to weight those different objectives and try and find um, you know, the optimal um, selection of, a, of a, any given, um, in this case, gene. Um, and so a fairly common, simple method, um, but this allows us to build a recommendation system that we can um, rank the 1,250 hits uh, with. And so in a little more detail then, we take the knowledge graph and the CRISPR screen, we also integrate that, and in the knowledge graph, we've added a lot of internal data relevant to this screen, so if that's clinical trials on these drugs or preclinical studies um, from uh, you know, mouse experiments with these drugs or perhaps with this disease, et cetera. We then compute a whole range of different um, fairly simple sort of graph node um, parameters like degree, et cetera. Um, along with the literature evidence and the pre evidence, we've run that all into this multi-objective optimization algorithm and, and rank the genes. And we're ranking the genes based on the weighting derived from um, you know, this expert input in the, in the bubbles initially. And so this allowed us to um, select, or well, the knowledge graph selected 36 genes from the 1,250. Um, and that sort of formed the substrate of our initial predictions. So the first question we had was exactly how um, relevant those 36 genes are. So the team um, uh, went back to five of the internal EGFR experts, so people who've been working to develop drugs against this pathway and this target for many years, um, and asked them to um, assess, you know, the, the the quality of the prediction. Um, and so there you see on the left, there's various categories here in terms of whether they were a known resistance marker. Um, and then if they were novel, we asked them to assess whether they thought these were credible hits, as in, you know, there's a plausible explanation from the evidence that we've provided that really suggests they could be involved in um, EGFR biology and particularly resistance to the EGFR inhibitor. Um, but also, you know, there were those that actually they didn't really think had um, you know, enough evidence to support that association. And you can see the, the breakdown here. So um, 32 of the 36 genes were either known or novel and credible. And then we have four that were in the eyes of these particular experts, not yet supported by the evidence that we provided. Uh, and so what's really nice is that a lot of um, you know, the known things, the things that we would expect to come, you know, we, we are um, uh, you know, finding through the knowledge graph approach, so you know, MET and P10, KRAS, et cetera, are all things that are fairly established as playing a role in the response to um, EGFR inhibitors. And then on the right, you can see there's a, uh, you know, a large number of genes that were, you know, novel, potentially novel uh, and very interesting hits that, that we're interested in. The, the sort of the bubbles here indicate the different pieces of evidence that went into the graph and um, the size of the bubble represents the 
uh, the importance of that data point to that prediction of that gene being relevant. And so you can see that actually, oftentimes some data types are really important across genes, so they're driving a lot of the predictions, but that's not always the case. And some genes are driven very specifically by some data, some are supported by lots of data types, for example. And again, this all builds into that sort of explanatory interpretability piece that is, is really important. So with our sort of 32 hits, the question then becomes, let's validate some, which is going to be real. And so firstly, we can go to the literature. So the, the, the left-hand figure here is from a sort of a seminal publication that described resistance to these um, class of drugs. And, and a lot of these are the things that we picked, back, picked up as being known. So just further reassurance. The three publications on the right, though, are all publications that have um, been published very recently, and so subsequent to our graph analysis, and actually support um, three of these new targets uh, as having a role um, in EGFR biology and the resistance and response to EGFR inhibitors, so FOSL1, BCL6, and the YAP pathway. So that's that's really exciting. It tells us that we're we're making predictions in the right area, and the graph appears to have some some relevance. But of course, we wanted to go further and um, actually perform some internal validation. So here we've again used um, a, a CRISPR-based knockout system, but this time not a genome-wide screen. So we're just specifically knocking out individual um, uh, genes, targets. And we're using two cell lines that are both sensitive to um, to osimertinib, which is to Griso, and we're using flow cytometry and so we we see the population of cells where 80 percent are wild type and 20 percent are made up of the knockout population we then treat the drug um, and take measurements of both day seven and day 14 and so what we're looking for as sort of illustrated in this cartoon is that you know as you go through the time course there should be if it's a true resistance mechanism you know in the presence of drug uh, you should see that actually there's an increased proportion of that knockout cell population in the study. And if we look at panel D here on the bottom right, so we have a DMSO treated sample on the top and then a um, Tegriso EGFR inhibitor treated sample on the bottom. And so here we're looking at MET and we have two guide RNAs, so there's essentially two technical replicas. And um, MET is, a, if you remember, is a positive control. We know it plays a role in resistance to um, EGFR inhibitors. Uh, and so on the um, y-axis, we've got the percentage of knockout cells in the sample, and you can see it always starts around about 20. Um, and then on the, the x-axis, we have days of treatment. And so in the DMSO treated, basically that line stayed flat. You know, there's no difference. Um, the, in, with DMSO drug, there's no selective pressure for the knockout at all. But when you treat with Tegriso, you can see that actually the non-targeting control stays flat, but the two uh, met knockout populations of cells increase almost up to completely overwhelming the culture by the end of the study of day 14. So that establishes that we have an assay that um, you know can validate these resistance hits. And if we look in panel C, we have the same format, but this time we're looking um, in, at some novel predictions that we've made. Um, and so we have two cell lines, PC9 on the left and HCC827 on the right, so both lung cancer, non specific lung cancer lines. On the top, again, we have the DMSO control, so all of our lines staying essentially flat. And then on the bottom, we have the drug treated ones. And again, you can see that um, in almost all cases, by the end of day 14, the knockout genes of um, KCTD5, NF1, and P10 are taking over the population of cells. So they are, quote unquote, true resistance here. There's some interesting differences in the sense that um, KCTD5 appears to be specific to PC9 cells and not. HEC827, and that informs us a bit more about the biology specifically um, and the other mutations that are um, effective in these cell lines. So really exciting, you know, we found some novel um, markers or, or drivers of resistance to EGFR using CRISPR screens and prioritized by knowledge graph. And so um, with my penultimate slide, I just wanted to summarize that. So we've built um, an extensive knowledge graph framework called BIKG, and we've used that to solve a particular challenge, which I've described around the ranking of CRISPR hits associated, CRISPR hits associated with drug resistance. That's been successful, um, and our results, you know, are supported by expert opinion. 
yeah, we are using the knowledge graph now for a, a, a large variety of other applications. And I've sort of described the fact that we're trying to um, push the application knowledge graph into the clinic as much as we can. But for this particular analysis, yeah, the knowledge graph brought several, what I think are major advantages. So the first is speed. Um, as I mentioned at the start, you know, it would have taken a manual expert, so PhD plus level scientists, you know, potentially months, you know, many weeks to evaluate 1200 hits. All right, in this case, we had to build the whole knowledge graph in the first place, you know, but it then took seconds to um, rank those hits. And now for every, every CRISPR screen that we run, we push them through a knowledge graph and we're ranking those hits within seconds. So now we're having to pay off as we're applying it to the subsequent um, CRISPR screens. There's also a novelty advantage. You know, so we weren't um, biased toward favorite genes or those that we've worked on or know about. Those that they, you know, the hot literature suggests might be interesting. Um, and, you know, that shows in the fact that we found genes that had no prior associations with GFR biology and some of which have now subsequently been validated by other groups, not us. And then the final piece is flexibility. So um, although we used our own interpretation of you know, what makes a good resistance hit to, to weight um, these 1200 genes, you know, I didn't talk about it, but um, we've actually built a system that allows scientists to change those weights you know, at a whim. And so if, if they're working on a study and they have a slightly different set of priorities, maybe you know, a, a clinical study is far more important for them than a preclinical study, they can change the weights um, at will and re-rank the hits immediately. So there's a lot of flexibility and it allows people to really explore the data. And I'd like to, you know, the team have done some fantastic work here and the, uh, the link at the bottom is to the preprint, which is now in review uh, that describes this work and um, would encourage you guys to have a read. Um, and now before I finish up, I, I wanted to reflect, you know, in the spirit of this meeting, I just wanted to reflect on um, you know, some of the more the bigger questions um, in the space, things that we've learned as we've done this process. So what do we think is essential to make knowledge graph work for pharma? So the first thing that has been really critical for us is have fully integrated teams. So, you know, my team in the bioinformatics group, you know, understand the graph architecture and they understand the biological problem, the question that we're trying to address. But the graph infrastructure itself needs to be supported by, you know, a top of the range IT team. And we're really lucky to have that amazing. And then in addition, we've got to be really closely linked to our bioscience or our wet lab colleagues. You know, there's no point in us making um, knowledge graph predictions if we don't have anybody who's bought into them and going to validate them at the other end. And also we need to make sure that we've really um, got close clarity on the, the question that we're trying to solve. That brings me to my second point. You know, we have to work very closely with the bioscientists, make sure that you know, we only take on questions for knowledge graph that really have strong potential for a solution. A knowledge graph is not going to solve all of our problems, particularly for drug discovery, which is very complex. So you know, we need to be focused and we need to make sure that we pick up apples and, and uh, go after the right problems. The previous speaker talked about data quality, governance, having fair data, et cetera. Um, you know, the governance piece, I think, has been particularly important from our perspective. You know, as we've gone through this process, we've actually rewritten um, our data policies um, as we've done it in order to allow us to have access to the data that we need in the scale at which we need. You know, a knowledge graph can consume vast amounts of data, and it's important that we have access to make use of it. But we have to do that in a compliant fashion that respects patient privacy and consent, et cetera. Uh, and then the finally, you know, graph flexibility. Um, as I mentioned before, there isn't one knowledge graph that's going to rule them all. You know, you, you've got to be able to tailor the graph to your question, and that requires a lot of expertise. And I thought, um, I think I've got a minute. So this last question here, when will we know that knowledge graph has been successful? So in the first of these seminar series, I posed this question to the panel. Um, and it was a bit of a tough question, deliberately so. And I thought, to be fair, I should try and answer it myself. Um, I don't know if I've got a better answer, actually, but I think there are obvious things that will help us um, you know, know if a graph has started to be successful. So firstly, technical validation. So as we've shown today, when we can validate the results of a knowledge graph-based prediction, then the graph has been successful in that you know, sort of context. Um, maybe skipping to the third point, you know, we'll perhaps know if um, 
uh, knowledge graphs, you know, if we're really embedding them properly in the process, you know, having an effect, if we can improve the metrics associated with drug discovery. So how long does it take us to get from a new target to a CDID, um, which in this case is a, sorry, I used AstraZeneca jargon, um, a candidate drug, um, uh, a new molecule essentially. And, you know, finally, when we get to phase two, how many of those drugs succeed, right? And, and if we've really embedded and included knowledge graphs in that drug discovery process, um, if the hype is right, those things should start to contract. Um, and then finally, to the second point, um, you know, knowledge graphs will be successful when we stop having knowledge graph projects, like when we just have knowledge graph enabled or embedded drug discovery as a process. And at the point where actually it doesn't really need a lot of data scientists in the loop, you know, maybe we're, maybe we're keeping the graph running, but actually, um, you know, our, our bioscientists, our bench scientists are familiar and confident enough with the graph that they're able to um, access it, manipulate it, uh, and follow up predictions from it, you know, without um, having to rely on an informatics team to hold their hand, if you like. Okay, um, I'll stop there, and um, I look forward to further conversation in the panel discussion later. I just want to thank um, the teams at AZ from uh, the R&D IT, so Anna in particular, and Krishna from my group in the um, early computational oncology group, has really led our knowledge graph efforts, and um, is absolutely a fantastic data scientist. And um, from our bioscience colleagues, so the guys who have been helping to uh, validate and study follow up these hits, we have Matthias and Alton. With that, thank you all very much. Hey, thank you, Ben. Very